live in each moment, each, whether I'm in my work moment, whether I'm in my parenting moment, be there a hundred percent and let the other thing go for a minute Mm -hmm. and just enjoy it and, and realize that those are the moments you're fighting for, right? When you're, when you're in your hard moments at work and you have the success, like be in that moment and don't Mm -hmm. stress about the fact that your kid is eating a crappy lunch at school that day. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're, if you're at your daughter's volleyball game and you're not able to get back to a client at work for an extra five hours, let that go and be there with your child and you're not going to be able to be perfect at both all the time. Welcome back to the Good Enough Mom Pinner podcast. I'm your host, Angela Mishuli. Thank you for joining me on this episode where I share my interview with Laura Monkholm. She is the president and co-founder of Walla. They have developed a powerful software solution for the boutique fitness industry, and I can't wait to bring you that interview. First, I want to invite you to leave a review for the podcast if you're enjoying the podcast, especially this episode where Laura shares so much expertise and information and things that are really going to support you as a mompreneur. And then also be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. And then to share the podcast episode with anybody that you think might find it helpful. I also wanted to make a quick announcement that last week I announced I have a new course that's launching this August called Unlocking Your Mompreneur Potential. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to get on the early bird waitlist so you can take advantage of early bird pricing and also extra resources and things that come along with getting on the wait list now. So look for that. And what are some of the things that Laura and I talk about in this episode? We talk about her um, start in the fitness tech industry and her realizing that she had a strength for tech and business and how that led to her then co-founding a company that's now disrupting the boutique fitness industry with how studios owners run their studios with their powerful software solution, but also how clients interface with those boutique fitness studios. So we talk about how she attempts to bring more balance to family and business life, what it's like to oftentimes be the only female in the room, and then to What are those soft skills that women and moms often don't give themselves credit for, but are so important in the business industry and are so needed by businesses today? We talk about that. And then two, we talk about self-care, boundaries, things that are not only going to be important to maybe a mompreneur listening to this episode who is a fitness studio owner but any mompreneur who's running a business. There are so many things that are going to support you in that. So one other announcement too, during this podcast recording, I was recovering from a cold, so you can definitely hear it in my voice. And we were having some technical issues here and there. So a few times you can tell the connection wasn't great. So I apologize for that. But we're not about perfection in here on the Good Enough Mompreneur podcast, <laughs> but most of the recording is amazing. And without further ado, here's my interview with the president and co-founder of Walla, Laura Monkholm. Thank you for joining me today, Laura, on the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you And I want to give you a quick introduction. You're the president and co-founder of Walla, a powerful software solution for boutique fitness studio owners. And so you were, uh, (laughs) you were telling me, yeah, right. And, and that's so important to have that niche. Um, 
And you were telling me earlier that you have been a solopreneur and then also, you know, you're at the C-suite level now. And um, I appreciate you being on the podcast to share your experience and to really inspire women to take action and uh, help me eradicate (laughs) self-doubt. Oh, that is quite the challenge you've taken on, but I right. applaud it. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so I'd love to hear how you started in the fit. Well, you're in the fitness tech industry now, but I'm guessing that you probably started in the fitness industry. I, I actually started, well, I guess I've always been an athlete. I, um, I grew up playing sports. I played mm-hmm. college volleyball. And, um, you know, on the side of my sales career in my early 20s, I started practicing yoga um, consistently and fell in love with that experience, especially as kind of a a complement to the, you know, very strong physical work I had done my entire athletic career. Mm -hmm. It felt like a nice balance of, um, you know, something that is movement based and definitely takes strength and balance and all of the things, but also has a beautiful um, kind of contemplative and um, just inward focused aspect to it as well. Mm-hmm. And I started teaching. So I, I was teaching on the side of my sales career and, um, you know, just doing it as a little side gig because I loved it so much. <laughs> mm-hmm. I So at yeah. some point you kind of found yourself in this C-suite leadership position or yeah. you found yourself in the fitness tech world so how tell us how that happened and some of the um some of the obstacles that you kind of encountered as a woman entrepreneur yeah well honestly when I reflected back on this and kind of thinking about these questions mm-hmm. having a mom had a lot to do with me um, moving into the tech side of things, actually mm. pivoting my career. Um, I, after a while of teaching yoga on the side, I had ended up uh, running a large yoga studio. I left my corporate career, my very career, and mm-hmm. <laughs> went to follow my passion in yoga. And um, I, I found that you know the the dream of running a big studio and doing that full time was really really intense for me personally as a mm-hmm. mother because i was um you know i went from working 50 60 hours a week as a as a you know a sales rep or a sales um manager and to 60 plus hours a week in the studio and mm. with one daughter and being pregnant with my second at a certain point I just was like okay this is I'm never going to see my kids and mm. it, it's really really good at the software we all had to use um, at studios at the time there was really one option called Mahdi mm-hmm. and for those of you listening if you've ever booked like a yoga class or a play class or a, a circuit training class on on the mind body app or on his website, you know, from 2000 until about 2018, they were really the only game in town. So they're, they're kind of the 800 pound gorilla in the space. <laughs> and I started doing consulting for studios, whether it was mm. straight up software consulting, teaching them how to use that platform or kind of business and sales consulting, where I would um, engage with them and help them develop sales processes and, um, operation strategies that would make their businesses more, um, not just profitable, but actually efficient so that they could have more time at home Mm. with their families and, you know, not be in the studio 60 hours a week. So my experience being a mom doing that job really Mm -hmm. compelled me to change what was possible in the industry. And, uh, yeah, I, I, after about seven years of at Solopreneur, I, I did a consulting agency. Mm. I had um, a handful of consultants working under me, and I started speaking at conferences around the world. It was cool, but also, um, oh, maybe it's the athlete, the athlete and competitor in me. But <laughs> I'm always kind of looking for the next rock up on the ladder, and <laughs> you know, I felt like I had done my best in that that capacity, and I was definitely curious about what was next. Um, 
And one of, the, one of my gigs that I had during that time was working with a, a gentleman named Doug Hecht on a fit tech startup. He had hired me as an advisor for a company called Limber. And as they were starting up, they were they really needed somebody who could help them understand what fitness studios needed, what they would respond to, and in our world, like finding product market fit. So making sure that what they were doing is what was being demanded. Mm. So I worked with him for a few months on that project and he just really connected and had um, a ton of mutual respect and, and we stayed in touch after that project wrapped up. And mm-hmm. uh, his company was ultimately bought by MindBody. And at a certain point, both of us had just kind of, you know, after his earnout was finished and as I was kind of wrapping up some consulting work I had done for MindBody, um, we both were like, okay, there's got to be better out there. Like a bunch of people have tried to compete with this company. It really is not great. They're moving in a different direction than we believe is right. Um, and we just feel like this, this industry needs an, a big up leveling from a professionalization standpoint, from a modern technology standpoint. And mm-hmm. I think we're the people to do it. So he and I decided to jump in and, um, you know, our, our skills complement each other really well. I'm, I'm, you know, personable, I'm out there, I'm sales, I'm in touch with clients. I love being up on a stage. Mm-hmm. He is an amazing operator, a brilliant strategist and has run tech companies before. So we had this kind of really great um, collaboration from the go and yeah, it's been, it's been two and a half years now. So we're, we're cranking away. <laughs> I love that story because, you know, for a couple of reasons, one, you took your motherhood, not as a limitation, but to kind of guide you to like evolve to what you needed and what you were really wanting to have in your life. And I'm curious, like oftentimes the women I talk to don't realize the um, talents that they have or their worth was there some point that you realized your strength with the tech side of things where you kind of had this moment where you decided to give yourself permission to pursue that yeah yeah in fact so when I I decided to start this consulting practice it was Mm -hmm didn't it took one of my amazing mentor soul sister friends um it, i will never forget being on the phone because i offered to go back into sales into like the same sales career mm-hmm. really really great lucrative offer mm-hmm. and i was like what would i say no to this this is so stable i know exactly <laughs> how to do the job i can make mm-hmm. a ton of money um it, I just did I knew I wouldn't love it. I knew it would just be, mm. you know, doing a job, not mm-hmm. actually pursuing something I cared about. And that's when she, she said to me, she was like, why? Like you have such a brilliant mind for this industry, this mm-hmm. fitness industry where there are so many women, especially. So the, the owners of boutique fitness studios are 75% women. Mm-hmm. So it's tons of moms, tons of women taking a chance, mm. following a passion and deciding to open a brick and mortar studio of some sort or chain of studios. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was like, honestly think there's an opportunity here for you to take your two passions, business and fitness and yoga and do mm-hmm. something really unique and special with it. Mm-hmm. And it was scary. It was really <laughs> like, you know, really scary to decide that yeah, you know what? Mm-hmm. I I do have something that's different and I do have something that is unique mm-hmm. at the time. There was really, there were maybe two people that I knew that were doing any kind of work in a similar fashion. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I leaned into what she said and said mm-hmm. yes. And I don't mm-hmm. think I would have done that without a, a supportive partner who, mm-hmm. who, you know, said, yes, follow your passion here mm-hmm. and be my a friend and mentor who kind of held up the mirror for me and said look at yourself this is this is something that you can really really make an impact doing and you'll be fulfilled like yes you can go make a 
very comfortable, you know, mold six figure salary, mm -hmm. or you can be really every day. <laughs> and it was pretty awesome. I, I think about that moment a lot because I had, mm -hmm. you know, I almost didn't do it. <laughs> right. You, you finally accepted the challenge and mm -hmm. uh, contributed to the 25% of women in the C-suite right now, um, which is mm -hmm. such a low number. And so we need women like you <laughs> leading the way. Um, I'd love to hear about how it was starting the business with your business partner and mm -hmm. what was, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, so my first experience was more of a solopreneur kind mm -hmm. of like start my own thing, do any, everything was done my way. And there was really no crazy wrong way to do it because there mm. wasn't a, a big, um, you know, there, there weren't precedents set for how it should be done. So mm -hmm. I had a lot of creative freedom. I made a lot of mistakes, but it was fine. You know, like I, I learned a ton this business with Doug and, and mm -hmm. building Walla from mm -hmm. the ground up. I mean, there is an established, very, very specific way we had to go about building a tech product. I mean, we, we have built a massive software product to compete with somebody who's owning the industry for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we had to raise a lot of money with mm -hmm. those of you there who are in the process and <laughs> how to raise money and what how to go raising money. Um, you know, we, mm -hmm. we had a, an initial group of small investors um, who were kind of friends and family and Doug and myself, we, you know, I personally invested a lot into this business. Um, but then ultimately had to go out to raise venture capital money and mm -hmm. we've raised 13 and a half million to date. So it's, it is not a small feat to mm -hmm. start a tech company because it is expensive. Like tech talent is incredibly expensive. There is a lot of work that has to be done. And we, the way we chose to do it was, um, you know, talk about a challenge, like making the decision to hire people and have our developers in-house onshore in the mm. U.S. Mm. is not something a lot of people do to start. Mm. We were so committed to having a team that was with us and who mm. believed in the product and we give, you know, our employees all have equity in the company. Mm. Um, we wanted them to have buy-in. So this wasn't going to turn into, um, you know, a, a par tech product like we wanted the product itself to be so hobby and so reliable with the reasons some of our competitors struggle you know like we saw that they tried to do it on the cheap and it it shows like people don't stick with them so you know it it took mm -hmm. a lot we pitched to dozens and dozens of <laughs> firms yeah. um, before finding the right invest that talk about you know kind of self out and mm -hmm figuring out who you are and trying to get people to believe in you. Like I was trying to get people to write us for millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is, that is not an easy feat. So I had to go into those calls as, as confident as possible. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah. what is, what that is like. Um, especially for a woman who's like partnering with, a male business partner, what do you think were some of the obstacles that you kind of had to encounter because you're a woman, but, but then, you know, what were your strengths, especially as a mom that you yeah. felt that you brought to um, the business? Yeah. Um, I mean, one, which, which for me, I think a lot of people feel this to go out. I, I'd love to on that and and um give a different perspective <laughs> i am often the only woman in the room um you know like i i go with pitches most of the time it was men for guy call or you know sometimes there'd be a screen on zoom of like and there'd be an analyst that was a woman um we did end up choosing our the the b series a you know our seed round mm -hmm. um, has a female partner and I adored her. Like she was so, <laughs> she's part of the reason we chose them was mm. just having that energy in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but I often 
from from childhood, like I always felt like being the only woman in the room was powerful. Mm. It it gave me a sense of um, first of all, it just it was different, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm I immediately command attention in a certain mm-hmm. way because I don't look like everybody else and mm-hmm. my voice doesn't sound like everybody else. So naturally people's ears will perk up when mm-hmm. my voice is <laughs> spoken, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also loud <laughs> <laughs> um, and opinionated. Um, but I felt like, you know, in this, in this experience, raising money at least, um, were time where the eyes, when there was a question asked, mm-hmm. people would look at Doug and not me. Mm-hmm. And that was very frustrating. Like the initial, the expectation was that Doug was going to answer the question <laughs> and I would maybe back him up. So mm. we kind of, Doug and I, he's such a great guy. He has three daughters. My business partner has three <laughs> daughters. So he's like, he loves the idea of like girl power, right? So right. <laughs> he, we'd have these actually laugh about it because we did all of our fundraising over zoom it was during covid for the most part and so we had our like little tells or looks at each other like our story so we'd like ping pong off each other like okay if the question's about this you answer it if the question's about that i'll answer so i think it took some coordination we recognized the same Mm -hmm. i was having and it just meant communication you know Mm -hmm. um but in general, I think from taking lessons or, or imparting little little bits of um, motherhood, if you will, into mm-hmm. my leadership style. Mm-hmm. Um, from the beginning, I I love being a part of the recruiting and onboarding process of staff, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. think there's an immediate need for me or, or desire for me to really welcome people into the fold and make them feel like they're a part of our family in the company, mm-hmm. and. I don't know. I I don't know if that's a mom thing or if it's a a woman (laughs) thing or if it's Mm -hmm. just a me thing, but Mm. it it really, I I feel like our team members definitely Mm -hmm. feel like they're a part of something, just a cog in a wheel. Like they, they Mm -hmm. know that they're important to our company Mm -hmm. and that they're seen and they have permission to, you know, be innovative and speak up and um, be themselves. And Mm -hmm. I really, really make sure that the process for everyone. So I, yeah, I I would like to think that's a part of me being a mom because I <laughs> I am very big about raising my kids that way that they are right. they are given permission to be themselves and to be mm-hmm. heard and to make sure that they feel seen. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So. I love that, and you know, I've I have had a corporate trainer who helps women ascend to leadership uh, positions and help them recognize their transferable leadership skills. And Mm. that is definitely one of the transferable skills that often comes up, especially at a time when it's really difficult to retain and hire really talented people. Um, So I love to highlight those things when we have these qualities and these abilities that we kind of take for granted. And I think we really need to shine a light on those things that are really important <laughs> and really our strengths and yeah. differ- differentiate ourselves and that we can really be purposeful about using um, as leaders, whatever we're doing. Yeah, um, I agree. I would love to hear more about your corporate mentor and leader trainer <laughs> person because those are always good to know. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, she's, she's, she's amazing. Um, and she really, you know, makes it a point that, um, women in companies, they bring her in for diversity and leadership training, um, Mm -hmm. know those skills. And, and I just love, you know, highlighting that anytime, um, I have an opportunity because I know even myself, I took for granted, you know, I had a a husband who he was in the military and he would get leadership Mm -hmm. training and would get a promotion, but women, you know, oftentimes spend more time with children and we're developing all of these leadership skills, being new parents and managing the household and doing all the things, but we don't always get recognized for that, or we practically never do. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, and we just take it for granted. Um, So I really like shining a light on that um, for sure. I will say one of the things that that I still personally I still struggle with is 
a lot of the skills that are recognized as valuable in mm-hmm. leadership mm. are very masculine, right? Like, or yes. they typically feel very masculine. So mm-hmm. dis- like quick decision making, you know, or decisiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, also, one of the things that I still like, I, I come into a board meeting, for example, and like, frankly, I'm, I'm fine with numbers and I understand the the finance side of the business, I am mm-hmm. not going to be able to step in the room and do like rain man math and <laughs> like spout out every single detail. Mm-hmm. And a lot of men will use that as an intimidating technique or, or just a puff, not even intimidation, but just like a puff their chest mm-hmm. technique. And so for me, it was a lot of learning. Okay. I do need to know my numbers. I need to make sure I go in understanding like what are the key metrics I'm responsible for knowing Mm -hmm. and understanding. Mm -hmm. And other than that, like I don't have to have every answer Mm -hmm. like on hand, being able to do every bit of math in my head. Mm -hmm. What I, what I struggle with still like the, the opinion I have or the feeling or emotion or um, you know, observation I have about the business that might be a softer skill side of things is just as important, right? Like if there is a key employee that is not feeling valued, or if there Mm -hmm. is a part of the business where I just don't feel like we are doing it in the right way for our clients because we're not hearing them appropriately or whatever it might be, those things are important too. And Mm -hmm. for me, it's a constant battle of like, okay, Laura, that observation is important and you need to speak up about it. It's, you know, it's just as valuable as somebody saying, you know, not hitting our, you know, Q4 budget number in this area and we need to make the proper adjustments. So it's, it's just a reminder to myself that people matter and those soft observations and skills matter just as much as the, you know, very tactical operations and hard and fast black and white numbers. A hundred percent. And I've had that same conversation um, on leadership on the podcast in that, and that's another thing I definitely love to highlight is, you know, again, with my own story, I thought I didn't have these super aggressive male kind of, you know, it didn't seem authentic to me or part of my personality, even that I wanted to try to adopt. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So even though I was a natural leader, I just didn't think that people would want to follow me or, um, you know, or I could lead them effectively if I didn't have those more um, male kind of traits, I guess, that we usually associate with leadership. And I love changing that script. (laughs) Right. Right. Because we absolutely don't have to be the loudest person in the room. We don't have to be the person with all the answers, like you said. We, um, you know, somebody, sometimes, you know, the, more, the most uh, effective person in the room is the quiet observer who's <laughs> sitting and processing and just listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's definitely a skill, especially as moms. We have to learn <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, it's one of the implications for me of being a leader in this capacity on my, on the way I mom and the way I, I actually <laughs> approach parenting mm-hmm. is that I realize the things that I want my kids to know. Uh, I guess, I guess the way I'd put it is I highlight things that I don't think I would have before in parenting. Mm-hmm. Like I really want my my daughter to know that just what we said, like the soft skills are as important as the, you know, hard black and white masculine Mm -hmm. skills. (laughs) And that my, I want my son to understand listening is as critical as Mm -hmm. making sure your opinion is heard. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it it definitely makes me bring these little things into (laughs) parenting and, and even like listening to their little, you know, the quarrels between the middle school girls or Mm -hmm. the, you know, the frustration on the, at, at my son's baseball game, like watching mm-hmm. him come out of a situation and being able to um, bounce back from a really tough game or a really tough play mm-hmm. and talking about what that took and and being comfortable 
expressing that verbally and not Mm -hmm. just having to suck it up and be like, all right, suck it up, get on to the next one. You know, like Mm -hmm. talk about it. What was it like to go through that moment? Mm. And do you need help, you know, thinking about the way you move on or do you Mm -hmm. feel motivated enough by that experience? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's it's definitely (laughs) interesting. (laughs) I find myself doing that too. (laughs) I actually, I have to watch myself now and I learned my daughter at school, she earned the grit award (laughs) for her grade Um, yes and I said honey that's amazing and she didn't really kind of value it because it wasn't the president's award or whatever it was for like the highest GPA and I said honey actually that's the most important award you could ever win and um she was really confused by that so we talked about grit and then she went Mm. and told her teacher (laughs) yes (laughs) I won the most important award so thank you (laughs) so I don't think her teacher really saw it the way I did (laughs) Um, and explained how important GPA was but then you know we had a follow-up conversation about you know what's important to teachers is you know not always what really serves us best after we're out of school but um but yes I've uh, that's so interesting because I think you can't help you know we don't go to work or parent and leave one or the other we're constantly doing both and again that's another one of our strengths right right (laughs) we can uh, learn how to juggle multiple things at a time for sure um and and I just it, it just you know, it's so important that we highlight those things. So, I mean, I imagine that it is a lot juggling motherhood and, and also your, your level of your position. Um, so I love to also find ways to inspire moms who are entrepreneurs to remember to honor themselves because we mm-hmm. so often put ourselves last not even in the middle (laughs) you know we serve everybody else you know mother's day is often a reminder that it's not just one day a year we need to take time for ourselves so how do you manage that oh boy um you know I think there are a few ways that I have consciously decided to honor myself one of which Mm -hmm. is deciding very clearly with me and with my family that fun is a core value and (laughs) it is part of life (laughs) I love that (laughs) that Mm -hmm. I am going to embrace because Mm I I mean what I realized is is as an entrepreneur as a mom as a busy 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 21st century woman it is Mm -hmm. so easy to just nonstop be checking boxes and Mm -hmm. nonstop be worrying and thinking about the next thing you have to accomplish and Mm -hmm. what you're missing or, you know, they're just, it's endless. And Mm -hmm. if you don't sprinkle fun into your day, into Mm -hmm. your week, it it is just going, life becomes a nonstop list, you know, (laughs) and and that's not the life I want to live. So we talk about that as a family. We think mm-hmm. about it, you know, at work, we, we have a very, we live in Slack at work. I don't know for those <laughs> oh, of you yes. that are tech companies, <laughs> but we live in Slack. And mm-hmm. so we have a very robust emoji and GIF library that we use. <laughs> and we constantly, I mean, the number of full on belly laugh out loud moments I have during the day with my team. I, I mean, it's <laughs> awesome. And mm-hmm. we, we take it seriously. Like we are committed <laughs> to having fun like that. Um, uh-huh. But, but also, you know, my, I made it really clear to my husband at some point that like, yeah, there are going to be days where Mm -hmm. we don't get shit done done at home because Mm -hmm. we're going to go to the beach or Mm -hmm. I'm going to go out to a concert or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to take a moment to enjoy. And it's, that's what makes life worth living. And that's what makes everything else. I mean, that's why we're working so hard is that we, so we can enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I think as mothers, it's really easy for us to end up resenting people Mm. or things or um, times in our Mm -hmm. life Mm -hmm. because we, we make the choice to prioritize the constant list over enjoyment and living Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's like, oftentimes we let the mom guilt creep in and we don't fully live the life that we really want to. But if we do go and develop that life that we truly want to have, it does allow for us to fill our bucket 
and then also have those amazing moments too for yeah. sure and yeah. it's so and I, I will say it is like it's almost it's practice right like mm-hmm. everything we choose to prioritize yes. in life it takes mm-hmm. practice to make sure that stays a priority right. and so whether it be church or whether it be you know fun concerts and beach mm-hmm. time whether mm-hmm. it's work whether it's you know being on the PTA mm-hmm. you have to make a conscious choice and mm-hmm. practice putting that first and so you're when you look at everything you have to do in your day yeah they're going to be absolute non-negotiables like your kids have to get to school and <laughs> you know you you have to eat right but mm-hmm. and you have to get the job done and there is guaranteed an hour in there where you can go, you know, do whatever that priority is. And for us, it's, you know, a lot of our quote fun ends up being movement focused, like playing sports or going hiking or going to the beach or, mm-hmm. you know, something that kind of accomplishes mm-hmm. multiple things. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, my husband and I often talk about the things that are like our families whether, whether we call them core values or call them priorities, mm-hmm. they're the things that we, when we're faced with that decision of like, okay, we've got time in our day. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do with it? Or, okay, we <laughs> need something that's going to shift the energy in our family right now. Everybody's mm-hmm. feeling stressed. There's a lot like kids are fighting. Yeah. You know, we're feeling really short tempered. Mm-hmm. What can we do to shift that narrative right now? And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, cool. Like, movement Mm -hmm. outdoors and fun are going to help us with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the most important word that you said is that you made a decision, you decided Mm -hmm. like, this is how, what's important to me. And then being aware of like, how are we feeling right now? And even though I want to get X, Y, and Z done, you know, shifting that priority to focus on everybody's well being is it's just something we have to do sometimes as, as parents, um, for sure. But part of that too, is really having boundaries in, in place to protect that time. And then, you know, having those priorities. So how is it that you kind of, um, work in protecting your time and having those non-negotiables like you, like you mentioned? Yeah. Um, it didn't start off easy at all, <laughs> right? <laughs> say. And still, I struggle with it. Sure. Like one example is, and and any of you out there that have business partners or business um, or coworkers that you have to work closely with, um, we have opposite schedules. Essentially, <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> that was something I learned very early on. He does his best work mm-hmm. from like 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. I do my best work from, you know, seven or 8 a.m. until one. Like that's, that's when my brain is most alert and alive and firing. And so we had to learn how to work around each other a little bit. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we both, he, he works fine during the day too, but I know Mm -hmm. like, I don't guilt myself anymore or get upset Mm -hmm. with myself if I'm not answering his slacks or his emails at, you know, 11 o'clock at night, I Mm -hmm. have put down, you know, early on I did, and I was super stressed about it always. And I was like, oh my God, I've got to get all of this done because we're both in this a hundred percent. And we are, you know, if he's giving at this hour of the day, I need to be giving at this hour Mm. of the day. And I just, I realized at a certain point that A, it was unsustainable and B, we're different, you know, like Mm -hmm. we are absolutely different people and I'm not going to give my best work and my most thoughtful responses Mm -hmm. or decisions at that point. So I need to wait until I can, and that's, what's going to serve the company. So putting boundaries around my time and it takes a lot of self-reflection to understand when you're going to be at your best and when you're going to be able to give what the company or what, you know, whether it's your kids or your company or whatever, what that cohort needs from you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I, I worked around my time. I will say my day is jam packed. Like I, mm-hmm. I absolutely pack as much as I possibly can mm-hmm. into a day so mm-hmm. that I can have my evenings with my kids mm-hmm. because that is, it's really the only time I get to see them during this, the work week. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, my time between like six, six thirty and eight thirty bedtime is super valuable to me. I don't schedule meetings at that time. Most of mm-hmm. the time, you know, every once in a while 
obviously like if I'm traveling, I can't, but if I am home, I am home and having dinner or at my kids' sports or whatever at those hours. But yeah, that means that I have zero breaks during my day most of the time. I mm-hmm. often start early and I crank and <laughs> there's not a lot of room for um, leisure time during my day. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that's how it works for me. I would rather right. do that and mm-hmm. then be able to have the 100% focus on my kids in the evening. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I think that's a common story where people start out not realizing what they need. They they know what's not working. <laughs> So, so from that stress point, they, they really start to understand where they need to work towards and, and assess, um, and assess things. And I think that that's like such a great part of being an entrepreneur is, you know, that kind of that freedom (laughs) can get you in trouble, but it really teaches you a lesson about how you want to live your life and, and, um, what's really important to you. So I'd love to hear about how entrepreneurship has changed you as a mom. We talked about that a little bit, but so often I talk to moms who may use their children as an excuse or their lack of time or resources, and they don't see it as we're not entrepreneurs in a vacuum and it's just not your time be running the business, but it's all kind of, you know, it all kind of works together and, and really entrepreneurship can change you for the better as, as a mom. So has that been your experience? Uh, some days, (laughs) no, no, honestly it has overall. Yes. Some days I feel like what kind of lunatic was I for deciding on this path? (laughs) But I always end up being like, okay, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. Um, (laughs) I think entrepreneurship, first of all, has taught me to have like a, a, I have to be malleable. I have to be Mm -hmm. able to pivot. I need to be able to adjust. And I think as as a parent, that's Mm -hmm. such a great skill to have because nothing Mm -hmm. stays the same, right? Your kids are growing, they're changing. And maybe Mm -hmm. the rules that have always worked in the house did for the, you know, (laughs) they, they've worked for the last five years and all of a sudden your kid hits an age that they totally don't work anymore. And you're hitting pushback every time. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to, um, you know, change and be comfortable and confident as you change. And so Mm -hmm. I think entrepreneurship is like, I practice that all day long. So (laughs) many things change in business and, you know, a tactic that you have for a while may work in one capacity. And then you have Mm -hmm. a new client that completely challenges that and you have to rethink it. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that my comfort level with change is, is really honed like my skill there Mm. is really honed because of being an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and it makes me not as frustrated with the changes at home Mm -hmm. um and with the you know the different phases that your kids go through Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) the other thing too is I because of needing to try new things and make Mm. mistakes and be Mm -hmm. okay with learning from those mistakes and making the next best decision as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I find myself not only teaching my kids about mistakes and how Mm -hmm. great they can be for you, but Mm -hmm. also like we as parents, like we'll apologize and be like, you know what, the way I just spoke to you is not great. I (laughs) I'm really sorry about that. That was a mistake Mm -hmm. on my part. And Mm -hmm. next time I'm going to work hard on it, you know? So Mm -hmm. rather than, rather than like, oh, I have to be right because I'm the parent, mm, you know, yeah. we, we actually have both of us, my husband and I have this mindset um, of, you know, let's admit to our kids when we make mistakes as often as possible. So they yeah. see mm-hmm. when we make mistakes, how we adjust, and they mm-hmm. recognize that that's actually a good life skill to have. Mm-hmm. And they can then come to us and, you know, when they're 16 and get drunk for the first time, I don't know, like (laughs) they realize, okay, maybe that wasn't the greatest. And, (laughs) you know, I learned from that mistake or whatever Mm -hmm. the decision might be, Mm -hmm. just giving yourself permission to, to reflect, Mm -hmm. make, make a decision to not do it again, or to try hard not to do it again and change. So entrepreneurship and just working a lot has taught me that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe one of them will bring home a great award one day. 
Yeah. No, I, I actually almost cracked up when you said that because my daughter got the, my com- her, my company, her, her school has a Got Grit Award and she won it last quarter. Oh. So I'm right, I'm right there with you. I've never been that's, more proud. I know. I was like, that's amazing. And she was just kind of like confused by my reaction because she just mm-hmm. didn't really value it. And I was like, what? That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's so funny. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I know it really oh. I'm I, more than anything I'm stoked that the schools have that I, I, I love that it's not just about the grades right exactly that's that's always what I preach for sure so um if you wanted uh, a message to stick with anybody listening to this podcast to take away um what would that be mm, I think you know one of the one of the I guess, pieces of advice I've Mm -hmm. often um, leaned on or Mm -hmm. quotes I've often leaned on. Um, It's a Brene Brown quote and it Mm -hmm. says, uh, perfectionism is a 20 ton shield that we carry around thinking Mm -hmm. it's protecting us. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's the only thing preventing us from taking flight. Right. And I think there is a tremendous amount of pressure in our society to be perfect at everything, mm-hmm. right? To, mm-hmm. to be the perfect mom that's got mm-hmm. your shit together all the time, that your kids show up at school on time, you're on the PTA. And it's it really isn't sustainable. And it's mm-hmm. not something that most of us can attain. Mm-hmm. So dropping that narrative and letting go of the constant desire for perfection, Mm -hmm. especially as an entrepreneur, because we cannot give a hundred percent to both all the time, period. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. the, the myth of being able to be perfectly balanced in life is one Mm -hmm. of those things to me that is, it ends up being toxic for people that are, you know, in entrepreneurship and and Mm -hmm. motherhood, because Mm -hmm. we, we feel like a failure all the time. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like drop the shield and just live in each moment, each, whether I'm in my work moment, whether I'm in my parenting moment, be there a hundred percent and let the other thing go for a minute Mm -hmm. and just enjoy it and, and realize that those are the moments you're fighting for, right? When you're, when you're in your hard moments at work and you have the success, like be in that moment and don't Mm -hmm. stress about the fact that your kid is eating a crappy lunch at school that day. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're, if you're at your daughter's volleyball game and you're not able to get back to a client at work for an extra five hours, let that go and be there with your child and you're not going to be able to be perfect at both all the time. So take flight in wherever, whichever, you know, column you're in Mm -hmm. at that moment and enjoy it. I appreciate you saying that so much because I think that was the whole point behind starting this podcast. I was so frustrated and confused by why moms just don't feel good enough and I think so much of that is this kind of idea of perfectionism and if they can't be perfect at something why even try or attempt to do it or it's something for somebody else but not for them and that's just all this false narrative (laughs) that we've either been conditioned or somewhere along the way picked up Um, right and, and, the other thing I will say uh-huh. is like, <laughs> note to moms that have school age kids, uh-huh. don't join the all class WhatsApp chat or whatever <laughs> <Yes>. it is. <laughs> or yes. if you are on it, <laughs> silence it because it will literally make you feel like the worst human ever most of the time. So uh. just don't pay attention. <laughs> And also don't be the mom that everybody looks to like cheat off their homework on because <laughs> you never, ever, ever get anything accomplished. <laughs> right. Yes. That's so true. Oh. I mean, it's such a journey with school age kids at different ages. Yes. And cause yes. you know, I have that for sure. Well, Laura, I so appreciate your time. You have a busy schedule yet. You took time to talk with me to, to inspire other entrepreneurs and moms on, you know, how the mindset they how to juggle it all the mindset they need to have and that you know shed the perfectionism so I appreciate that so much and where can listeners connect with you and learn more about Walla and all that good stuff 
Oh, awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> Walla, you can find our website is hello Walla, W-A-L-L-A.com. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully some of you have now used the Walla app, booking your classes yeah. or have a Walla account at your studios. Mm-hmm. We're at hundreds of fitness studios around the country now mm-hmm. um, and growing every day. So if you are mm-hmm. ever in a position where you're frustrated with your studio's software or the (laughs) the booking experience, please let them know that you heard about this awesome company called Walla. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Or if you own a studio, please check Mm -hmm. out this awesome company called (laughs) Walla. Um, But our, our Instagram and Facebook handles are both uh, at Walla software and you'll see me on there quite a bit. I, you know, I try to share honest stories and I try Mm -hmm. to give um, shout outs to the mom entrepreneurs that are owning (laughs) studios out there and uh, highlight a lot of them in Mm -hmm. our content. So you'll, Mm -hmm. you'll see some pretty inspiring women doing amazing things for their communities in there Mm -hmm. as well. That's incredible. I know it's a very time demanding and you have to be in person a lot. So uh, anything to help make that easier as an entrepreneur is, is great. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Yes. Well, thank you so much thank for having you. me. Absolutely. The pleasure is all mine. I thank you so much, Laura. Bye-bye. Thank you so much to Laura for joining me on this episode of the Good Enough Mom Pinner podcast. I will leave all of her contact information and in more information about Walla should you be interested in learning more about Walla. That will be in the show notes. And also I want to make the announcement that we're taking a little hiatus for the summer until after the 4th of July break. So I hope you are scheduling some time for rest and relaxation and connection with your family this summer. Put away that checklist of all the things you want to accomplish and realize that uh, taking some rest time really is just, you know, a way to help actually propel you forward. So I hope you're making time to do that. And I can't wait to come back and share more amazing episodes of the Good Enough Mom Panora podcast with you when I get back from vacation and some downtime. So I look forward to that. I hope you're having a great summer and thank you so much. I'm so grateful for all the listeners, the guests, and everybody who supports the podcast I mean, it's just incredible. I can't tell you how much all of the emails and messages mean to me. So thank you for that. If you would like to connect with me, you can reach out to me by visiting my website, mombusinesscoach.com. We have some incredible guests and podcast episodes coming at you later this summer and going forward. So be sure to subscribe, leave us a review and share this podcast with anybody that you think might find it helpful. So until next time, I'm Angela Micheli, host of the Good Enough Mompreneur podcast. I hope you have a great one. Bye.